先生は、えー、ニュージーランドに生まれて、えー、オークランド女子大学を卒業と、修士の文明の大学で、えー、設計事業をしています。で、専門は太陽光関連の事業をしていまして、また、えーまあ、1908年現在、太陽光関連といえば、まあ、最終的には日本なんですが、えーそまあ、県全く資本主義関係で行われる、娘、娘家論争。Right, well,、uh, thank you all for coming along.、Uh, this is a lecture、um, aimed at an undergraduate audience, so the mathematics will be、uh, necessarily reasonably、uh, elementary.、Um, but it, it will be an interesting trip through some of、uh, science and, and mathematics, in, including some fairly、uh, recent stuff. So let's go.、Uh, <coughs> So, to begin with, I'd just like to, to motivate everyone for, to be thinking and studying knots. So, knots,、uh, although they're rare in nature, there are examples of knots in nature.、Um, plants can get tied up in knots, even a, a snake has been known to get tied up in,、uh, tie itself up in knots. But on the whole,、uh, nature does not seem to. Take advantage of、uh, the possibilities from, from, from knotting. An example of knots in nature, which,、uh, where it really doesn't take much advantage, is that the DNA molecules. DNA molecules are long and thin、um, molecular structures, and as such, and they're quite flexible, so as such, DNA、um, sort of unavoidably、uh, ends up being tied in knots. But,、uh, Essentially, one might say that nature ab abhors a knot for DNA because DNA has to get packaged into this very tight structure, so knots are a bad, bad plan. So, in fact, nature avoids knotting、uh, in DNA and goes to great lengths、um, to avoid the、uh, DNA molecules getting tied up in knots. So much so that there is surely a period when evolution, evolution of,、uh, of life on Earth was probably blocked. For a long time,、uh, as unknotting mechanisms were developed、uh, for DNA. Anyway,、uh, so although nature perhaps does not exploit the possibilities of knots,、uh, human beings have exploited them for a long, long time.、Uh, surely hundreds of thousands of years, as long as they've been able to h a d the sufficient digital dexterity to produce knots. So、uh, here's an example of a, a knot which is、uh, in constant use by human beings. This is sort of the first knot that、um, is used all the time, but perhaps not everyone knows how to tie. So we all know how to tie knots in our shoelaces,、uh, and this is a knot that slightly more, more, requires slightly more knowledge how to tie, but is, ext is extremely useful. Uh, if in all kinds of endeavors.、It's, uh, these days it's not favored by climbers because it's if you're climbing a mountain, you really, your life depends on, on your ability to tie knots. We'll see another area where that's true later on.、Um, so you have to have extremely reliable knots, and this bowl, and I believe, is out of fashion、um, these days. This, is, this knot, let me write up the name it in English. Called a bowlin, pronounced bowlin, and I'm sure the knot has a Japanese name also. Perhaps someone here knows a Japanese name for this knot. It's used in Japan. Right? Okay, if you say it loud, everyone can hear. <laughs> 
I can't. If I repeat it, no one will understand me. Okay, so that's the Japanese name. I, I, my experience in Japanese has not been so good so far. The only uh, words that I seem to learn, no, no Japanese person seems to be able to understand me saying them. So uh, I certainly won't try. Anyway, this is the bowl and a fabulous knot. Uh, really, I, I used it a lot. Um, so, in fact, here's an, here, this knot is, imp is important. And you, if you look online, you'll find lots and lots of instructions on how to tie it. So uh, this particular piece of um, structure is, is called the eye, and, and this shows you how to actually construct the, the bowling step by step. This last procedure is just tying off the loose end. So um, perhaps less important. But there, there's the bowling, a very important um, knot. OK, so here is a knot. See the, when, once you get sensitized to knots and thinking about knots, you start to see them all over the place. So here is a knot which you know I would certainly like to be enjoying right now. Um, this hammock, you see, is, is a whole lot of rope all tied all tied together in a knot, and there's all kinds of knotting going on here. And even the individual strands of this hammock are actual uh, are themselves actual actual knots. So knotting on all kinds of levels and orders of magnitude. Uh, is really quite prevalent. So to see another example, uh, this is a whole lot of cloth, right? And cloth, you know, the shirts that we're wearing, for instance, if you think about it, they, what are they? They're big, very, very complicated knots, complicated mathematically. They have a, a structure. So uh, in fact, we all of us interact every day in a big way with knots. So knots, you know, it's the um, really non be all part of our our day-to-day uh, -day existence is actually um, knots. So they're also used for decorative purposes. This is um, this is a, a Norse decorative knot, knot that has some role in Norse Norse, Norse mythology. I'm sorry, I've forgotten exactly what it is, but um, I think this is, a, this is a beautiful picture. It's a tree that's managed to get itself tied into a knot. As I said, it's a bit unlikely in nature, but. And um, the, uh, this, the, the many, many, many practical knots which are used all the time. This one is called a sheep shank. Um, uh, somewhere there's anyway, it's, yes, it's called a sheep shank, sheep shank knot. And it's what's it, what, what it's used for is for uh, shortening a, a rope. So if you're on a boat, say, and you have a rope, long piece of rope, lying around, and you want to stop it getting in the way. And you want to actually somehow compactify the, that knot, and a sheep shank is a standard uh, standard way to do it. So, um, so you'll see that the, the rope comes in here, and then it does this loop around here, and so on, and goes goes out. And so, in fact, uh, it's important that if you pull on it, it just undoes. Okay. So there's nothing. Um, Mathematically exciting about this knot because it, 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 it really isn't a knot at all, but it's uh, because of the friction, because of the friction created by these this looping around here, it, it actually holds together. In fact, if you pull on it the, the most obvious way, it doesn't get undone at all. In fact, it just tightens up. So, but on the other hand, if you pull it the right way, it will just completely come undone and go back to its original length. So there's a very useful knot, and you'll see these knots have numbers on them. It's 1155, 1152, 1153, 1154, and so on. So you can imagine that somewhere uh, there's a huge uh, catalog of knots and of various kinds and their uses. And indeed, the, the, um, the Knotter's Bible um, is this book, a the Ashley Book of Knots. So Ashley was a sort of an American... Um, Playboy uh, millionaire uh, in the middle mid 20th century who had a hobby of going around on boats and co collecting pictures of knots and, and um, ways of drawing them from sailors and others. So you'll see that this, this proudly boasts 7,000 drawings presenting uh, three, three th over 3,900 knots. And um, there have been more recent and more systematic attempts to uh, catalogue uh, knots by the, the, the various people who are involved in, in practical knotting, and uh, I have you know I have 
been slightly involved in that, suggesting that maybe a mathematical characterization is, is, uh, is a good one to start with. So let me go back and emphasize, even though I haven't yet defined the mathematical concept or not, let me just use as an example this, this uh, sheep shank, which mathematically obviously is trivial. I mean, if you just, uh, if you just thread this piece of rope back through it, you, you undo it. In fact, it's important that you can do it and undo it without any, you know, cutting any string or something. So mathematically, it's a sort of trivial knot, but physically it has very important characteristics. So um, in these tables of knots, the, the, whoops, these proposed tables of knots, what I suggest is that one should start off with a mathematical uh, classification or listing enumeration of the knots, and then on top of that, add the physical characteristics that make it a good knot. So um, the, at the moment, this, these future characterizations are mired in debate and anger and argument. So um, we will see. And the, so as things stand, it's this Ashley book of knots that's the, the Bible for, for, for people who make knots. And there are a lot of people around um, who actually make knots, uh, tie knots, as for their living. So um, I dare say in Japan and, and certainly in other countries, you can go to the seashore and on a crowded day, you'll see people actually selling uh, their wear. And uh, this is a particular decorative knot called the Leonardo knot, I believe. And it was made by uh, the people whose logo is in here. This is the, the, um, the collection of people, or the, how shall I say it, the uh, society uh, by, or made up by people who actually use knots for a living. And that, is, that society is the International Guild of Knot Tires. <coughs> the International Guild of Knot Tires. And um, they have a journal which is called Knotting Matters. So uh, because of my own involvement with knots, I was uh, fortunate to be elected the vice president for life, honorary vice president for life of the International Guild of Knot Tires. So I receive every uh, uh, few times a year, I receive this journal, Knotting Matters. And I have to say that, you know, I tend to read it maybe more than most of the mathematics papers that I that don't come across my desk. So um, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. There's all kinds of ways of making all kinds of new knots, and uh, some of them practical, some of them decorative. And I recommend to anyone who's interested, I recommend signing up for the International Guild of Knot Ties. If you look at it on the web, you'll have no trouble finding it, and you can um, subscribe to the journal uh, very easily. Actually, I, was, I felt very honored to be elected vice, vice president for life of this guild, so I, I felt uh, the need to do something to, in return. So what I did was I, I wrote an article um, on the mathematical, the mathematical um, point of view of knots, and uh, I submitted it to the journal Knotting Matters. Um, so that caused a certain amount of debate uh, uh, among the uh, editors of the journal. They weren't sure whether to accept it or not because it didn't really, it wasn't like any of the other articles that they had in their journal um, in presenting this mathematical point of view. But at the end of the day, they actually published it. I think it may even be in this particular issue here. It was, it was a while back. Um, and it caused a certain amount of controversy among the Guild members in the, in the following issue, there was uh, uh, some s several letters to the editor complaining about my paper. Some of them liked it, some of them complained about it. In particular, there was uh, an old salt, an old sailor uh, living out on, on Long Island who really complained bitterly and, and said that I had no business talking about knots. Um, and that, uh, in fact, I didn't even know what a knot was, that, that what I was calling a knot should probably be called a grommet. So uh, there you go. Um, <coughs> it's an interesting. Uh, anyway, I've been to I've been along to a few of the guild meetings, and it's it's, it's great fun, great, great deal, a uh, great view. So anyway, now let us therefore, uh, having had this practical introduction to the practical side of the subject, and I hope I've pointed out that it really is. Uh, you don't notice it, but it is quite a significant um, 
part of our everyday lives. You know, you start thinking about knots and you look around, you see them everywhere. So, uh, so now to the mathematical uh, definition of, of what a knot is. A knot is simply a smooth, closed curve in three-dimensional space. So what do I mean by this? I mean that there, is a, there are functions... Um, the functions x of t, y t, and z of t, uh, that which are smooth. These are these are smooth and periodic. So that means that as as you follow around this curve, it'll come back on itself after say t when t is equal to one, you get back to the initial point. <coughs> and uh, so this is called a, a parameterization of the knot, parameterization. But what we do is we forget the parameterization. What we actually call the knot is the image of uh, this function, this this um, three, this this vector-valued function of the variable t. Its image in three-dimensional space is called the knot. And so we, and the knot is of course capable of having many different parameterizations. If you could, if you just change the value of t by any any smooth uh, function of t, then you'll get a different parameterization of the knot. So knots are smooth closed curves in three-dimensional space. I guess you want some condition about the tangent vector never vanishing. So it be <coughs> nice. um, but let's skip that technicality. Now, they may or may not be oriented. If you have a knot, um, then you can consider, so here's a knot. And you can make it into an oriented knot. An oriented orientation simply means a direction way of going around. So you can just put an arrow on the string, and that's the picture of an oriented knot. Um, so, uh, and links, the, the, word, the next important word is links. So we have knots. Links are just disjoint unions of knots, each individual knot being called a component of the link. So, for instance, uh, I could easily add a component to this one. by doing that. There I've got a link with two components. <coughs> um, and orientations, I, I could just put a, you know, put an arrow on the, each of the components if I wanted to. Uh, now, the, now comes the important question, the important mathematical question and concept, which is what do we mean in, in mathematics when we say that two knots are the same or equivalent? Well, what we mean is the, the technical term is um, if one can be obtained from the other by applying an orientation-preserving diffeomorphism of R3, maybe that's a slightly advanced term, but uh, it's just a function of three variables from R3 to itself, which is smooth, uh, everything inside is differentiable, infinitely differentiable, and the inverse, it has an inverse of the map, so, uh, the, and the inverse is also a uh, diffeomorphism. So the Jacobian of, of this map at every point is an invertible matrix, and everything is smooth. Um, and the Jacobian has, uh, is positive everywhere. It's an orientation-preserving diffeomorphism. Now, this is equivalent, fortunately. This is equivalent to a very intuitive op op uh, operation, which is you, that you can just push the strands of the knot around in an arbitrary, smooth fashion and, and transform one knot onto the other. So it transforms exactly a very intuitive notion that we that we all have. So suppose I had a piece of rope, piece of rope, and I tied a knot in it, then I could look at it like that. That's then that's that's the knot. But then I could also throw it up in the air and catch it. It would look quite quite different, but it's the same knot, right? So when that process of throwing it up in the air and catching it, that's an isotopy. So so that's what we mean. So fortunately, we said. This notion of being the same is a is a very intuitive one, very um, easy to easy to grasp. So, <coughs> there's the de the uh, mathematical definition of what we mean by uh, <coughs> by e equivalence of knots. So, now a few words about history. As I said, knots, the physical knots, have been studied and used, but maybe even used is much better than studied, by humans for you know, many, many thousands of years. But 
the mathematical mathematicians uh, mathematics didn't get into the game until relatively recently. Um, it wasn't really until the 19th century that we saw any mathematical work on knots. You won't, for instance, find any uh, papers by Newton uh, on knots. It just doesn't, you know, you can look, but uh, as far as I know, there's no, there are a couple of instances before the 19th century, but they're pretty rare. The first um, mathematician of note to say anything about knots was Gauss. Okay? And Gauss, And Gauss was interested in knots because of his uh, uh, theories of electromagnetism. And what he was interested in was uh, what happens if, whoops, sorry, what happens if, for instance, this uh, component here is made of, uh, met of, of wire, and this one is also made of wire, and you pass a current through this one and a current through that one. What's the conformation of the electromagnetic field produced by these, by these two currents? And what Gauss uh, did was he, he found an integral formula for a, for a very simple uh, invariant of, of these knots, for a, 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 an integral along these two curves, which somehow ex expresses some kind of winding number of the electromagnetic field that they produce. So I'm not going to go into that very much. Um, Gauss had a student called Listing who, who went more deeply into into this and, and began looking at uh, different possible knots. But the theory, the mathematical theory of knots really started to get underway uh, towards the end or mid to late 19th century. So in the late 1800s, uh, where there was, and, and it was inspired by this, by this uh, theory of so-called vortex atoms. So I want to explain this theory. It's a very fascinating theory. So, um, so here's what a, a vortex looks like. It's a vortex in, 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 in water. And um, that's what an atom looks like, or it's supposed to look like. Now, if this theory of vortex atoms had been true, then um, this, that would also be sort of a picture of an atom. Because the idea was that uh, back then there was no uh, relativity around, so, and we were all supposed to live in this universal medium called the ether. And uh, the idea was that the ether itself had become tied up, it, it was tied up in knots, and it, it, vortices have, had formed in the ether, and they got tied up into little knots, and it was those little knots that were uh, atoms, right? So, you know, everything was composed of these little knotted vortices, and the atom didn't look like this uh, at all, according to this theory. So, all right, well, so we now know that the theory was uh, not exactly correct. Um, well, this idea, this idea of the stuff of the universe being made up of little strings that it gets closed into loops is still with us, of course, in the form of, uh, of, of string theory. Um, but anyway, the people who were involved in this vortex theory, the main people were, were these people. This was Tate, Peter Guthrie Tate, and this is... Lord, this person here is Lord Kelvin, whose, other, whose name was actually Thompson um, before he became a lord. And uh, what, what happened was Tate, whoops, Tate was giving a lecture, somewhat perhaps a little bit like my lecture, but a much better lecture than my lecture because he had a big apparatus uh, sitting on the stage and, and, and a bellows. So, and he pumped this apparatus and into the room, the audience came this great big smoke ring. So there was smoke, and the smoke came out of the tube and went right out over the audience. And uh, in the audience was, uh, was, was, was uh, Lord Kelvin, and he was extremely impressed by this experiment because these, this smoke ring that Tate had formed preserved its structure for a long, long time. And so he, he was inspired by that to think that maybe these vortices in the ether, if they closed on themselves, could be structures that would be essentially permanent structures. A really beautiful idea, and, and maybe they could get tied up into knots. So um, he and others were started, you know, taking this idea very seriously. They were trying to explain the periodic table of the elements, Mendeleev's periodic table, by looking at the different properties of the knots that could form. <coughs> 
as not in vortices in the ether. So first of all, uh, were, there, were there certain knots that were likely or impossible to be formed <coughs> by smoke rings and by, you know, this structure of smoke rings? So that was, that was what uh, the, um, Tate and, and, uh, and Kelvin and their followers were, were looking at. So the first thing that, that they wanted to do, and they, they began this project, they are the ones, uh, Tate and, 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 and others, were, were the ones who began this, this project um, of, first of all, just writing down a list of all knots. Okay, so this is called a knot table. And this is the beginning of the knot table. This is uh, taken from, basically, this particular table goes right back to Tate himself. So here's the here's the knots in in, in, a, in a table. The unknot is this one, and then <coughs> there's the next knot is the so-called trefoil knot. That's this one. This is the figure of eight knot, and then five one that will surely uh, occur in Ashley's book under various guises, and uh, five two I believe is one is is called the oysterman stopper in Ashley's book, and so on. Anyway, these these knots become more and more complex as you add more and more crossings to them. And this is the beginning of a table. And as I said, this table was produced by um, Tate and Little and, uh, and other people. And they were looking, they would, they would find one of these knots and they would look at it and try to figure out whether it had the right kind of properties to be uh, a knotted vortex in the ether and what would the chemical properties of that knot, knot, knotted vortex be. They were trying hard to see the structure of the periodic table. <coughs> emerging from these knot tables, which of course never did. Um, but the table uh, lived on. So the first thing to ask yourself about this table is, well, how did they, you know, as you add, if, as you make the knots become more and more complicated, um, how do you tell them apart? How do you figure out, for instance, that this particular knot here is different from this one? Remember, but when we say different, we mean after performing these isotopies. So how do you, if you take this 5-2 and then you start twisting it around and so on without ever cutting the string, how, do you, how can you be sure that you can't transform this picture into this one? Or this one into this one? Or indeed any of them from this one? How do you know that um, any knot is different from any other knot? And any, knot any knot is actually genuinely knotted. Well, that's, that's kind of a difficult problem. And uh, the truth is that they didn't really have any methods to, to do this. So one wonders how they would actually make this table. And one just has to assume that apart from some rules of thumb, that they would just draw the next knot or, or make a rope model of the next knot and just keep trying to see if they could make it look like any of the previous knots, just experimentally. And if after, I don't know, an hour of trying, a day of trying, uh, they failed, and they would declare this knot to be a new knot. <coughs> okay? And that's how it went. Well, you can imagine that, uh, so this is just the first ones. They actually classify knots, all the knots, up to 10 crossings. There's about 200 of those. So, you know, 200, uh, comparing the 200th knot to all of the 200 previous ones, and our, it must have taken a long time. And indeed, this, this knot table took uh, 10 years uh, to compile. And it is remarkable, truly remarkable, that it was complete. Completeness actually turns out to be not so remarkable. It's fairly, it's fairly easy to be sure that you've got them all. But what's not at all clear is that you don't have any duplications. And um, uh, let me come back to this in a second. Once you've done knots, you can go on to links. And I just wanted to get a picture of this link up. This is actually a link with two components. It'll have a role to play if you think about this thing goes around like that, and then there's another component there. Um, this will have a role to play later on in the talk. But um, uh, let, let me just skip ahead a bit. I'll come back to this. So there was, so we were talking about this table of knots up to 10 crossings. And there were, actually, they did make one mistake, only one. And, and in the modern tables, these are the 161st and 162nd knots in the list of 10 crossing knots. These are called the, the Perko pair because Perko, who's actually a lawyer in New York, who sort of had his knot books on the side and he'd, he'd actually done a PhD in knot theory, he discovered that these two knots are actually the same. 
the reason that Tate and Company thought that they were different was because there was one of these rules of thumb, these principles, and according to that principle, these two knots were, were, um, were inequivalent. And this was the first example, actually, of this principle of Tate uh, being, being wrong. So uh, the exercise is to do what Perko did, which is to try and prove that you can actually transform this knot into this one. Right. So, um, okay. So now let me just go back and talk about what the, what the, what the problem is here. So, um, as I said, we have been talking about knots, and we've been drawing a lot of pictures of knots. But you have to distinguish the notion of a picture of a knot, which is what I've been doing here, and the knot itself, which is an inherently three-dimensional thing. It's very fortunate that for any one of these knots, you can faithfully represent it by a picture, draw a picture of any knot. So you can reduce <coughs> knots to actually two-dimensional objects, two-dimensional combinatorial objects, as these graphs, these planar graphs, the graphs in the plane with, with, uh, with vertices and, and uh, strings connecting all the vertices. And then you have to know what, what the crossings are. So immediately, we see that there's a problem. We have this problem that we could actually, we, it's obviously very useful to talk about knots in terms of planar diagrams of them. But the question is, when do two planar diagrams represent the same knot? Okay, so in other words, we have this intuitive three-dimensional notion of isotopy or equivalence under diffeomorphism, very nice three-dimensional notion. And we have these planar pictures. So the question is, can we translate the equivalence of the, of the three-dimensional objects into a two-dimensional question, equivalence of diagrams. And this is done uh, by, move, by, by means of the right of Meister move. So these are moves on pictures of knots that will manifestly not change the, the three-dimensional structure. Um, but it, it, the theorem is that these moves are enough. They, they solve the problem of when uh, two uh, not two pictures of knots, when do they represent the same three-dimensional object? So here are these fabulous uh, Reutemeister moves of types one, two, and three. Here they are. If you look at them, you have no trouble seeing that the three-dimensional knot uh, will be unchanged. So you just perform this knot, this move just locally. The rest of the knot out here is the same. And if you just put in a, a, remove a kink or put in a kink like this, then the knot is the same. If you pull this bit of string across that bit of string, or the other way around, the knot doesn't change. It's a three-dimensional knot. And the most complicated is the so-called type three Reutemeister move, where this string here, well, the way I've drawn it, this string goes underneath the crossing and comes out here. So that obviously doesn't change the three-dimensional knot. The three-dimensional structure is the same. So the theorem of Jude Reutemeister is that any two pictures of the same knot same three-dimensional knot, can be connected to another by a sequence of these Reutemeister moves. And obvious planar distortion. So that's a wonderful theorem because that means that we can now reduce the problem of three-dimensional equivalence of knots to a problem in planar combinatorics, simply these pictures up to these moves, which you could easily code. Gauss was the first person to put a, give a sort of computer code for knots, and you could you know, reduce it to a sort of computer problem um, in terms of these, uh, these two-dimensional uh, projections. <coughs> All right, so, and this, of course, well, is a big step on the way to helping the, the compilers of the knot tables because you can look for what, what are called invariants. If you can find something, if you can find some kind of mathematical structure that you can associate a number or a, <coughs> or a group or something, anyway, something as to be associated with a picture of a knot, and you find that it doesn't change, it doesn't change when you do these three Reutemeister moves, then you've got something that is attached to the knot and depends only on the three-dimensional structure. No matter what isotopies you do, you get the same thing. If you can get something combinatorial invariant that doesn't change under the Reutemeister move. So such things are called invariants. And uh, this Reutemeister theorem gives us the possibility of creating these invariants. And in fact, the link with this Perko pair is that the reason, the re here's an interesting story, the reason Perko discovered this Perko pair is that he was looking for 
uh, he wanted to go on and do 11 crossings. So the table up to 10 crossings existed. He wanted to go ahead and do 11 crossings. There's a lot more, a lot more knots with 11 crossings than 10 crossings. So he had to have some fairly powerful tools, some very powerful invariants at his, at his disposal. And he had some nice invariants. And as he was testing them, he tested his invariants on the 10 crossing knots. And he found that no, none of his invariants would distinguish these two knots. So, you know, he had these, all these invariants, and he tried them all out, and the, these two knots always ended up coming out the same. So he began to suspect after a while that maybe they were actually the same knot, and that's, uh, that's what happened. All right, so let's move on to uh, the, f the not, this wasn't the first invariant, but it sort of was the first what one might call beautiful invariant, and it remains sort of the the summit invariant, the nicest sort of s simple invariant of, uh, of knots. And it's called the Alexander polynomial. As I said, you get to associate whatever you like to a knot uh, as, as an invariant. It could be a number. And in this case, it's a polynomial. It's a polynomial in the variable t. Um, and uh, here it is. Well, here, actually, this is, th this is uh, a way of calculating it. Let me just skip ahead and tell you a few examples, I'll come back to the way of calculating. So this Alexander polynomial of the trefoil ends up being this polynomial. Notice that it's a Laurent polynomial with powers of T inverse, and it has integer coefficients. And um, I'm only going to give you two examples, um, uh, so you won't see the, the key property. But actually, if you, if you put T equals 1, you get 1 there. And if you put T equals 1 in the next one, you get 1 too. But anyway, so here's a knot. This is called the Conway knot, and it has the property that its Alexander polynomial is equal to 1, which is the same as the polynomial no knot at all. So this particular knot, which I've <coughs> drawn here, I can, on request I can draw it freehand on the blackboard, um, has the property that its, uh, its Alexander polynomial vanishes, if, if you like. So it's not distinguished from the unknot. Well, it's Alexander polynomial. It's the first knot that actually this is true of. So let's go back and, and talk a bit more about the Alexander polynomial. This is a way of calculating. What I'm going to tell you is not really what it is so much as a way of calculating it. And this way of calculating it was emphasized, uh, in fact, developed by Conway himself, John Conway of the Game of Life. And um, it opens up a whole new uh, perspective on, on knot theory. So here's the deal. Um, we're going to suppose that we have three knots or links <coughs> which are oriented and that they are the same uh, except near a crossing. So here's a crossing. There it is. There it is reversed and there it is eliminated altogether. Okay? And the idea is that we have three links, L plus, L minus, and L zero. And away from this crossing, they're absolutely identical. The pictures are absolutely identical. So imagine... That this little these, this little picture here is inserted into a great big mesh of of, uh, of, uh, of of string, just like we did, by the way, with the Reutemeister moves. Uh, they themselves were, were happen locally. The, whole, the rest of the knot surrounded the picture of the Reutemeister moves. So a very similar idea here, but this time, of course, the uh, the knots will be completely different. When you change a crossing like this, L plus and L minus might be very very different. In fact, you can have an extremely complicated L plus, uh, and the L minus actually is, is nothing at all. It's an unknot. And L zero, of course, uh, if these two are knots, this will be a link typically. So this is a relationship among oriented links. This is called a skein triple. This is the word uh, introduced by Conway to describe this as skeins. And this is called a skein triple. So the idea is simply that if ever you have three links, L plus and L minus and L zero, that are related in this way, then their Alexander polynomials satisfy a certain relation. Here it is. Delta L plus of T minus delta L minus of T equals the square root of T minus one over the square root of T times delta L zero. So it's three links. Their Alexander polynomials are related in this way. And this here is just a normalization. The unknot <coughs> has Alexander polynomial equal to one. All right. Now, what I want to convince you of is that this, these relations, plus the fact that it is an invariant that only depends on the knot in three space, are enough to calculate the Alexander polynomial. 
calculate it. So after, after this lecture is over, you can go away and calculate the Alexander polynomial of the trefoil and check that it was no mistake that that was correct. Calcu if you get really ambitious, you could calculate the polynomial of that Conway knot just from this relation. So how can that be? Well, it's, it goes back to another Alexander <coughs> a couple of thousand years earlier, Alexander the Great, who demonstrated quite graphically that you can un undo a knot if you allow yourself to cut the string. Okay? So if you allow yourself to cut the string, then, you're, then you can go, whoops, from uh, this one to this one, right? The, the, the string has gone through from being over to being under. So the idea is that you can take any knot that you like, any knot or link, and you can reduce it to the unknot, untie it by a sequence of crossing changes. So with this in mind, we're going to try to calculate the uh, Alexander polynomials of all links inductively by, by, mathem by mathematical induction. So we take a link, this complicated link, and we make it, we focus on a crossing. Alexander the Great tells us there is a crossing, but if we change it, it'll simplify the link. We focus on that one, and we call that one L plus. Then L minus is simpler, right? Because we chose that crossing. So by induction, we know the polynomial of L's L minus. L zero, well, that's way simpler. That's even got one less crossing. So by induction, we know that. So we simply solve for delta L plus in, in, in this formula here. We know this one, we know this one, so we know the delta L plus. And in this way, we can build up the Alexander polynomials of all knots right, by induction. So this formula suffices, and it's actually easy to apply. And the reason that Conway introduced it was it's extremely effective. He claims that he calculated the Alexander polynomials of all 10 crossing knots, so all 200 of them, in an afternoon using this formula. I tend to uh, not really believe him, but he's Conway, so uh, maybe he's good enough. All right, so here's the, the results of these calculations. If you do it, you get this one and this one, <coughs> and lots more. You know, there's polynomials for all of those knots. All right, so now, uh, having used up a lot of time, I'm going to turn to the topic of braids. This talk was about uh, knots and braids. But what are braids? Well, braids are sort of, if you like, they're knots with a certain amount of structure. Uh, they also um, have a long history. Um, <coughs> try, try as I might, I could not rotate, I'm sorry, I could not rotate this picture so that uh, this is my daughter, my eldest daughter. Um, so this poor girl's on her side in this picture. But anyway, I think you know what it's about. Uh, women often, and some men actually, tie braids in their hair. Okay, and that's and the braid, uh, I'm sure you can think of lots of other examples of looms and so on. And the mathematical braid will be uh, a sort of mathematical model of this kind of braid, just as the mathematical knot was a model of those knots that I talked about at the beginning. So here's the mathematical uh, <coughs> definition of a braid, and the point about it is that the braids, unlike knots, are going to have the structure of a group, which is a very important mathematical structure. So here's a braid. This is a braid on four strings, and it has these essential ingredients that there's two bars, a bar at the top and a bar at the bottom. The bars, the points, the four points on the, on the bars are joined to each other by strings. And these strings are like knot strings. They're smooth curves and so on. And um, the point, the, the thing, in order to qualify as a braid, the, the idea is that the tangent vector has to go up. Once it starts going up, it's never allowed to turn around. So here's what's... <coughs> What well, is not a braid, this picture here is not a braid because it has a bad part. <coughs> here it's turned around and going down. So it's not allowed in a braid. So um, now I w what I want to do, th so the braids, you know, are considered up to the same kind of isotopy as knots were. So you're allowed to sort of stretch and, and, and so on. The strings, as, as long as you do the stretching and so on in between the two bars, you're allowed to do arbitrary isotopies. So what I have to do is now tell you what the group structure is. <coughs> this is important. I said the groups are an important structure in mathematics, and groups have an operation. So here's one braid, and here's another braid. I want to multiply them and apply the group law to them. And uh, here's the, it's very simply done. We take the two, we, t we stack them up. We put one on the bottom and the other one above it. And we join up these strings and remove the middle bar. And we get this braid here. So that's the product. This is, if this is alpha and this is beta, this is alpha beta. Okay, we obtain the braid alpha beta. 
Uh, this braid has, has generators. There's some elements such that every element of the braid group can be written as a product of these generators and their inverses. And that's simply a twist the generators. So for instance, if we were dealing with the three-string braid, uh, it would be generated by the sigma 1 and sigma 2, uh, where it was a simple twist between these points and a simple twist between those points. These generators uh, have certain relations, and it's well known that um, that you can capture the entire structure of these braid groups as, as words, as, as products of these braids and their inverses, provided you apply these two relations here. Um, this one, sigma i, sigma i plus 1, sigma i, and this one, uh, sigma i, sigma j equals sigma j, sigma i. So if the two things are uh, next door, then they have this complicated relation, and if otherwise they commute, the so-called commute in the braid group. One times the other is the same as the other times. So these relations have a very simple geometric interpretation. The first one, you see if you look at it, this is um, sigma i, sigma i, sigma i plus 1, sigma i, sigma i plus 1, sigma i, sigma i plus 1. This is actually just the type 3 Reuter motion move that we've already seen. The second one is this commuting. If this is sigma i times sigma j, then you can slide it down, that's sigma j, sigma i. So these relations sort of completely define the uh, braid group. <coughs> now, there's a way to get knots from braids. And this is the reason that I've chosen these two topics, put them side by side. If you have a braid, the closure of the braid, so-called closure of the braid, is an oriented link obtained as follows. Uh, we take the braid, there it is, and we simply tie the bottoms to the top. Okay, so, and then we remove the bars. So there's the braid alpha, and here's the uh, closed braid, this, this link in general, alpha hat. In this case, we've, be, we've obtained a knot. This is, in fact, the figure of eight knot, uh, four one that we've seen before. All right, and the idea um, of that the, the was around for a while in the 20th century, it, it came into its own in the late 20th century, was to use the, the group structure of the braid group to study links. So these links are sort of wild stuff, you know, there's no, they don't have any group structure, but braids are very organized and they form a group and mathematicians love groups, so the hope was to be able to use group theory to study, to study links. And there's some obstructions to that. And so in, in order that for, for this to get off the ground, you, you have to know that every link that you want, you can get from a braid. And this was proved by the same Alexander uh, as the Alexander polynomial. He showed that any oriented knot or link in S3, that should, that's just a fancy word, it's a three sphere. So it's, you, it, this just says that any knot is a closed braid. Okay? Good. So in theory, we can use uh, braids and their group structure to say things about arbitrary knots. Right now, uh, it's been, you know, as you may have got the idea, it's, it's sort of been one of the joys of my life that every now and again my uh, research life intersects with my actual life life. And uh, one of the things that where this happened is in, in a big way is in uh, kiteboarding, which I do as, as, as often as I can. Uh, so this, believe it or not, this is actually me uh, up here. This was on Maui uh, last year at a... At a Subfactor conference. Um, sorry, my, yeah, my wife took the picture and she didn't do anything fancy. She was just standing on the beach. She took a picture. She didn't. You know, you can cheat on these things and lie down in the sand and you get some. She was just standing. So um, anyway, so this, so anyway, I guess that that's supposed to, that picture is supposed to define for you what kiteboarding is. You have a kite. Oops. You have a kite up, uh, that's up in the air, and then you're on a board, and you, you use the kite to pull you along. So um, here's a schematic of what the kite is. So, so you have a bar, which is the thing that I was hanging on to, and then the kite is there, and there's four strings going from the kite to the bar. Okay, so if you look at that, and you, take, you know, think of it from a mathematician's point of view, then what you see is you more or less that you have the identity braid here. If you think of these four strings as forming a braid, then you have the identity braid. And um, so, so, on the other hand, like the DNA molecules, when you pack up your kite, you're going to wind the strings, the strings up, or you know, just by Murphy's law, every now and again, the strings are going to get into a tangle. Um, so the first job 
the first job that the kite kiter has when he sets up his kite is to get this tangle that he's presented, which is the, the lines in some possibly quite complicated form, and actually make them into not just any old braid, but the identity braid. And this he does in two steps. The first step will be to apply Alexander's theorem to make it into a braid, make this knot into a braid. The second will be to apply the braid structure to apply the inverse operation in braid in a group to reduce it to the identity braid. <coughs> so this is done by every kite boarder, whether he knows it or not, uh, when he sets up his kite. So this is what you might be presented with. This is just the arbitrary mess that your strings might get into. <coughs> and then you go in steps. So this is me, uh, also on Hawaii, but this is on Oahu. Uh, and this is, oops, this is the typical um, tangle that the, that the lines have got into. And somehow I've got to turn this mess into the identity braid. So step one, make it into a braid. There, at that stage I have achieved that. It's a braid. You'll notice that in between, uh, in between this hand and this hand, the strings are just going forward. They're all twisted around, but they're a braid. And then you apply the, in the fact that the braids form a group. You can apply the inverse, in invert every element by using those generators, and you turn this into the identity braid. And it's very important that you have the identity braid because if your strings are connected wrongly and you're out in 20 knots of wind, the kite can go wild and pull you and smack you against something so that the consequence of failure can be quite dramatic if you have the wrong braid. Okay? This, this is approximately worldwide about um, uh, one death every two months um, from various causes, not necessarily tangling, uh, having the wrong braid, but certainly the wrong braid will, is a really bad idea. So very important that you, that you do this manipulation correctly. And so, you know, every kite border is actually applying um, Alexander's theorem and the group structure in, a, in, a, in the braid group every time he goes out kiting. So perhaps I'm the only one who really appreciates this every time. So. Um, once again, a nice practical use of, uh, of knots, of, of braids in this knot theory. So the obvious um, question that arises is <coughs> analogous to when the two pictures of knots get actually represent the same knot. We know that we can get any link as a closed braid. The question is when do two uh, braids actually give the same link? You can get the same link in lots of different ways. The answer is by these so-called Markov moves, which come in two kinds, which have a very nice uh, group theoretic flavor. The first one is incredibly group theoretic. It's simply conjugation. So if you take an element of uh, one braid group and you multiply it <coughs> left and right by left by beta and left by beta inverse for some other braid, then you're going to get the same knot when you close it. And similarly, if you take one and then you look at it in the next braid group and you multiply it by the next generator, then you're going to get uh, the same knot. So I've got some pictures which uh, proves that. Um, and the theorem, like the Reutemeister theorem, due to Markov, is that if two knots, two braids have the same closure, then they can be connected by these moves. So here's the moves diagrammatically. Um, here we have the, uh, so the type one move. We've conjugated, so we've got beta here and beta inverse here. Well, Beta will just go around the back and then come around and it'll meet, meet its inverse and it'll cancel away, so you get alpha. And this one is the next, the type two move, where we've taken alpha and we've stuck an extra string on it. We've done a little twist there. And this picture, if you look at it, you'll see that this is just a kink. This is like the type one Reutemeister move. So these two group moves do not change the, the link. So we've reduced, therefore, the problem, once again, the problem of uh, and this, of the structure of all links, we've reduced it to a problem in group theory about braids and uh, conjugation in the braid group. So um, this uh, actually is the way in which this so-called Jones polynomial uh, was discovered, and I'm going to just tell you a little bit to end the talk about the Jones polynomial and some general remarks. <coughs> so um, amazingly, it, it, it ends up being quite similar in story to the the Alexander polynomial. So here's a way to calculate at least. It doesn't prove that it exists. The proof that it exists went through Markov theorem and all that stuff. Um, but here's a way 
to prove that, to calculate the Jones polynomial. Once again, we have this skein triple, just as we did. So we have three, three links, L plus, L minus, L zero, which are the same except near a crossing. And there they, have, they look like that. And the relation that we're going to use is hauntingly like the Alexander relation. You have to look closely to see the difference. The, uh, the difference is that if I was defining the Alexander polynomial, uh, this 1 over t and that t would not be there. Okay. So um, the same argument that, we, that I went through carefully for the Alexander polynomial was like changing the crossings to make the knot simpler shows you that you can calculate the Jones polynomial simply by applying this, um, this skein relation and to reduce the complexity. And if you do the calculations, uh, here's a few examples. If you take the trefoil knot, which we've seen, that was the first uh, three crossing knot, three one, uh, you get this polynomial, t plus t cubed minus t to the fourth. Now, mirror image is actually corresponds to t going to one over t. So just this calculation shows you that the uh, trefoil knot and its mirror image are different knots. Now, here's this, uh, this link that I put, this two component link rather complicated one that, that I put up here. And its Jones polynomial is simply minus root t minus 1 over root t. So a huge amount of cancellation goes on. And uh, in fact, um, this polynomial is the same as the polynomial for two unlinked circles. So you remember back to the Conway knot, that complicated 11 crossing knot, didn't tell that was it was the, as far as the Alexander polynomial was concerned, it was the same as the unknot. So for this link, as far as the Jones polynomial is concerned, it's the same as an unlink. Right? It was, of course, this link was the first uh, example found, and it was found just by sort of luck searching through the computer tables by Moore and Thistlethwaite. One more example, the figure eight knot, which is known to be the same as mirror image, has this as its polynomial. And that's symmetric under T and T inverse. Okay, so, um, so that's the situation. And I'd just like to uh, end up in the last uh, minute or two here by summing up the progress since this, uh, th th this polynomial was discovered in 1984. And that's uh, 31 years ago. So there's been a certain amount of progress on it since then. And uh, the first thing was, the first really nice uh, thing was by Lou Kaufman, who discovered a very simple skein theory so instead of, um, instead of that skein relation where you, in, which involved uh, changing a crossing, Lou Kaufman's way is you simply <coughs> eliminate the crossing and you consider the two possible ways of eliminating the crossing and there's a similar relation. Uh, but you have to be a bit careful about how you apply it. But it, it becomes very explicit, gives explicit, very explicit formulas for the Jones polynomial which were used to prove a whole lot of things and, uh, and constant use by mathematicians and physicists. Uh, Ed Witten in 1988 gave a quantum field theoretic interpretation um, using the Chern-Simons uh, function in, in some Lagrangian. And uh, this would, I, I would call this completely fanciful, but for the fact that he produced a formula which allowed you to, to define the Jones polynomial extend it to other spaces other than R3, other three-dimensional spaces. And his formula was absolutely correct and was verified by lots of mathematicians. So even though the, none of the terms in his definition has much meaning, uh, it's obviously something going on. It was a fabulous piece of intuition and work. Vasiliev gave a sort of power series where he would take, um, take T and put E to e to the h and think of it as a power series and e to the h and he managed to give some kind of meaning in terms of singularity theory to the coefficients of the polynomial and here this was part of a big theory of his uh, which became a, uh, some of it became the theory of so-called finite type invariance and uh, I think finally uh, Kovanov most recently developed a homology theory for knots <coughs> of which uh, VL of T, the Jones polynomial, is actually the Euler characteristic. So this requires a little bit more advanced mathematics, so let me not go into that. Um, in spite of all of this theory, it's wonderful and uh, often very sophisticated mathematically and physically, uh, 
uh, in spite of all this theory, there are two major open problems which I'm going to end, end with, which you can start working on tonight if you want. So the first one is very hard, and the question is what polynomials do you get? So you remember that I, I wrote down, that, well, I didn't write down many, but I did write down a couple of polynomials with knots. And the question is what polynomials do you get? And, and that, you know, no one has much of a clue. There's certain polynomials that uh, it's easy to see do not occur, uh, but to, to guess to, as to if you write down a polynomial, is it the Jones polynomial or not? Well, who knows? The point is that that's known for the Alexander polynomial. Known for the Alexander polynomial. So in fact, the Alexander polynomial and the Jones polynomial, the only real simil similarity is in their definitions. After that, all the theory is different. Here's a possibly easier problem. Is there a non-trivial knot whose uh, Jones polynomial is, is identically equal to one? So is there a knot which the Jones polynomial can't tell from the unknot? Well, that's open, although we saw for links that it's actually been solved. I'd have a lot to say about that particular question. Um, but the, all, of, all of these questions are really, um, the fact that they're questions is associated with a fundamental lack of understanding for this polynomial. And that is, what is the meaning of this variable t? They've written down these polynomials in this variable t, but what on earth is t? These sort of physics approaches give some kind of answers, like um, the exponential of Planck's constant. <coughs> That's great, but it doesn't help very much uh, um, in terms of trying to come up with solution uh, to these problems. So progress is probably only going to be made um, when this question is answered in some meaningful way, some useful useful way. <coughs> Just, you know, as I said, you can actually start tonight uh, working on, this, especially this problem here. You could try um, to can come up with a polynomial, a knot with trivial polynomial. I should just warn you that all knots up to 20 crossings, and there's more than a billion of them, have been looked at, and none of them have come up with an example. So you're not very likely to solve that problem tonight unless you have some outstanding new in intuition and idea. So anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>